through the book of First Kings. And uh, it began beautifully with uh, Solomon's ascension to the throne and, and the United Kingdom. But uh, when we got to chapter uh, 11, we began to see Solomon's woes uh, through his uh, love of outlandish women who eventually brought into the land uh, idolatry and false gods. And because of that, the Lord allowed the kingdom to be rent into two portions, uh, ten tribes in the north and, and two to the south. And we saw in the 12th uh, chapter how this began to happen uh, through a man named uh, Jeroboam. And uh, we see finally that in verse 19 of First Kings chapter 12, verse 19, we see, So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And of course, this is a doesn't mean unto this day uh, right now, uh, although spiritually it might, but he's talking historically as the writer of First Kings at the time he wrote this document somewhere around, uh, I don't know, about 600 B.C. He's recording back a, 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 a rebellion that happened around 975 B.C. and he's saying it's 300 years ago and to this day the division still occurs in in uh, in Israel and and the civil war began and and the country was split in two and uh, 10 tribes were to the north and uh, two stuck together in the south the southern uh, components being um I don't know can I write on this thing am I still permitted to do this <laughs> yeah we're going to write on it anyways whether they like it or not and uh, and so if you look at the land of Israel what you'll find is up in the north Ten of the tribes are going to go up here, and these ten tribes will be known as Israel. And two tribes will stay in the south, and they'll be known as Judah, and it'll contain basically Judah and the small tribe in here of Benjamin. And Benjamin will be kind of nestled right in there. And these two tribes will be in the south, and the ten in the north, and this will be kind of the way the land will be split for hundreds of years there. Now, in the south, we see that uh, Rehoboam is the king, and in the north, this man Jeroboam uh, becomes the king. And, and uh, it uh, goes on and explains to us in verse 20, And it came to pass when all Israel, uh, most of those tribes, uh, they heard that Jeroboam was come again, and we read prior in the chapter. You can go back and look for yourself. He had been in Egypt, and he, he comes here now. When they heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and they called him, unto the congregation, and they made him king over all Israel. There, were, there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when uh, Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, and, and what had happened is, uh, you read the story again, Rehoboam had left uh, Jerusalem down here, so I'll, I'll, I'll draw it for you just so you see historically, the capital city of Jerusalem was within the tribe of Benjamin, and so the capital city right here is Jerusalem. And he had been called up to the north to Shechem to have a meeting. And now he runs back down into the south to uh, his uh, area. And uh, when he, verse 21, came back to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and uh, four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel and to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Uh, a score, I don't know, it's an old term, that uh, English term, it, a score means 20. So four score would be four times 20, so that'd be uh, 80. So it uh, would be 180,000 uh, men. He gathers these men together and he says what we need to do, to do is we need to go back into the north and we need to um, beat them into submission through a war. We need, we need to bring them back into submission. Uh, I, I, his thought is, uh, God wants this land united. And, and it's the will of these people to run away from God, and we're not going to have that. We're going to grab them back, and we're going to bring them back into submission to the true God and His temple in uh, Jerusalem. That's what we're going to do. That was his thought. Does it sound like a good thought? Well, I mean, after all, you know, what's going to happen up here is there's going to be gross idolatry. And the people are going to be doing wrong things up there. 
And wouldn't it make more sense that we, we force them to come back to the real God and worship Him? I mean, it almost sounds like a semi-decent idea. Um, you know, the forced unity. There, there was a guy that did it in our country. His name was Abraham Lincoln. There was a time when, when the, the southern uh, colonies wanted to pull away. The southern states wanted to pull away. And you know, we're not going to have that. We forced them back into submission. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a good idea. Let's see if God thinks it's a good idea. So, so here's Ray Bohm thinking. It, it's better to have us united. We're going to be united around, around the true God. Verse 22. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, who was the man of God saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, and there, there you're going to have the remnant defined. Uh, the remnant are the folks who are remaining faithful to God in His temple. And just as there was back then an, an historical remnant Within all this land, today in the church, God wants and, and has a remnant of people that remain faithful to the true God. And that would be those of you who are born again. See, because the picture of, of this big land here physically, Israel, would equate spiritually to the, the church. Okay? The church is big all around the world. There's church in China. There's church in Korea. There's church in Indonesia. There's church in the Philippines. There's church in South America. There's church in Europe. There's church all over the world. Lots of things called church. But, but who is faithful to God? Who would God call the remnant today? Well, the remnant are those that remain faithful to what he said and to his gospel. So anyways, he says to the remnant, now here he's saying now, the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God. He says, speak to Rehoboam, speak to the remnant of the people. And this is what you tell them, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house. For this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. You know what, you know what I think about this? This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Amen. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? You, you ever heard that of v phrase before that I just said to you? It's from the Gospel of John chapter 6. It's when Jesus gave a very a, a difficult teaching about who the bread of life was, which was Jesus Christ. And when he was all done, the, the disciple said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Truth is hard. Now here's a hard truth. God permits free will. God permits rebellion. God permits people to worship false gods. God permits false religions. Even false religions that call themselves Christian. Just like over here, he's got false religion calling itself Israel. And God says to those of us who are in the remnant, it's not our business to fight them. You and I are not supposed to go fight against Roman Catholics. We're not to fight against United Methodists or United Presbyterian. By the way, any Protestant denomination got the word united in it and kick it out the door. It's united to the world. There's the word united is only in your Bible once. Genesis 49. It says, be not thou united unto them. They're united to the world. You know what God like to see? By the way, you ever gone down the street and seen a, 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 ch a, a church sign that says separated Presbyterian church? Well, you won't. That's what God would like to see, not a united Presbyterian church. But you know what? It's not our job to fight those liberals and those apostates and those false counterfeit Christians. It's not our job to fight them. God permits that. If that's what their heart wants, God says, let them go after their heart. I'll get to meet them one day in judgment. But right now, 
let them go. There's going to be wheat. There's going to be tares. You remember that? Okay, that's from Matthew chapter 13. The, the confusion about how that verse is taught. Maybe I'll go there real quick. I'll just teach you real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 13 real fast. I'll show you real fast. Jesus gives this parable. When he says it's from God, doesn't mean he wants it. It just means he permits it. Matthew uh, chapter uh, 13, verse 24. Another parable uh, put he, uh, Jesus, unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And he went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. When they first grow, they almost look similar. Wheat and tares look very similar. It would take a farmer probably to tell the difference from them at a distance. But when it's time for the fruit to come forth, uh, the, the fruit comes forth out of the wheat, but out of the tare, nothing comes forth. And then you can tell the difference. But until you're actually inspecting the fruit, you wouldn't know. They, they look very similar. And, and somebody asked him, uh, verse 36, uh, the disciples, end of the verse, the disciples came to him saying, Declare us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. I just want to help you. He didn't say the field is the church. Well, there's always going to be wheat and tares in the church. He didn't say that. He said the world. The field is the world. Uh, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Those are the children of God, born again by faith in Jesus Christ. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The devil sows counterfeit. That's his job. God makes the true, and the devil makes the counterfeit that appears like the true. The U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury makes a, a real dollar bill and counterfeiters make one that kind of look like it, like a tear, almost looking like a wheat. But it's not real. And the devil does this. And the devil has up here all these tribes that claim they're Israel. We're going to see they're nothing like Israel. Israel means prince with God. And those who are princes with God follow the word of God. And listen to their father God, who is the king of kings. But you can run around with this title, but empty on the inside. Outside look like a white old sepulcher, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. And that's what counterfeits are like. That's what tares are like. And God says, I permit this. I, I permit this. I'm not stopping it. Uh, uh, for example, go back to where we were, uh, verse 27. Uh, the, house, the, the servants of the householder came and said, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath it then tares? He said, An enemy hath done this. The servant said, Will that we go and gather them up? Let's get our armies together and go beat these things into a pulp and, and rip these things up and force them into a submission. He said, Nay. Nay. Lest while you gather up the, the, the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. And the reality is, look at me up here, folks. In this area where most of those people were apostates, there still were some faithful believers. One day a prophet came to the Lord and said, I'm the only one left in Israel, Elijah. He said, I got 7,000 in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So I don't want you running up there with armies killing them. And, and, and here's the reality. In our counterfeit churches of today, so let's, let's do our equivalency over here. The faithful remnant today would be the equivalent of born-again Christians. That's the faithful remnant. You must be born again. This would be the equivalent of every other thing on the planet that calls itself Christian but isn't. So the major thing would be Roman Catholicism. That would be the major Christian denomination on the planet. It's got a billion plus adherents. That would be Roman Catholicism. What else? Mainline Protestant denominations. 
dead Episcopalians, dead Anglicans, uh, dead Presbyterians, dead Methodists. They're, they're, most of them are, are dead. They believe another gospel. They don't believe the gospel of grace. They believe the gospel of works. That'd be all these things. He says, don't you go up and try and root them. Up. Why? Because inside of these things, there's still some life. Now, they didn't get it from the denomination. They, they mostly got it from someone else coming to them, but they never had the wisdom to pull out of the thing. And they're still there. And the Lord says, no, no, don't you worry about it. Nay, let them grow up together. Verse 30, let them both grow until the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, I'll say to the reapers, go ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And, and he says uh, here when he explains the whole thing, verse 39, the harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. And I'll send them to pick the good from the bad, not you. It's not your job. Don't go fight. Don't go fighting. That's not our fight. Go back to where we are. Return every man to his house. End of verse 24. Therefore, they hearken, therefore, to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. Of the Lord. Our battle is not to go out there and tear down Catholic churches and knock down statues and do that type of stuff. That's not our job. Our job is to go out into the world and preach the gospel, not to fight with other religions. When you hear about religion, fighting with religion, it's not from God. He just gave you the orders right here. That's not our battle. Now go back to historically what happens. So what happens historically? Uh, then Jeroboam built uh, Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built a Penuel. And so what he's doing, he's, Shechem is around in this area. It's in the southern region of this uh, northern part, right about here. Shechem is here. And Penuel, I can't remember. It might be a little bit to the west there. And he's building some cities, as most kings do. They're involved in building projects. Verse 26, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Hmm, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So now he's thinking again. He's saying, okay, let me think about these people. All of these folks, whether they're Judah, Benjamin, or any one of the other ten tribes, have all been taught in the books of Moses that they're supposed to go to Jerusalem three times a year. They're supposed to go at the Passover. They're supposed to go at uh, the Pentecost. They're supposed to go at the Feast of Tabernacles. So he says, I'm the king up here, and, and what am I going to do when all these people make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem? And they go into Jerusalem, and they see that beautiful temple, and then maybe the Spirit of God begins to work in their mind and begins to work in their heart and begins to work and to prick their conscience, and they start to think, what are we doing rebelling against the nation that God gave us? Maybe we'll... They'll repent and they'll turn back to what they're supposed to do. So he says, I got an idea. Verse 28. Whereupon the king, that be Jeroboam, took counsel and made two calves of gold. I wonder what kind of counsel he took. That sounds like evil counsel. That sounds like wicked counsel. You know, I mean, Rehoboam had taken some counsel in the prior chapter that we had read about. And what we had seen was, actually, it might have been even the beginning of this chapter. It was the beginning of this chapter. And, and at the beginning of this chapter, uh, Rehoboam had taken wise counsel and he had taken foolish counsel. And, and here this man obviously is taking foolish, evil counsel to build two calves of gold. And, and he said unto them, to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's a long journey. Who needs to make an, a big trip like this? Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And so he makes his, his uh, idolatrous, uh, I'll put him in blue. And he, he makes one here in Bethel, and he puts the other one up here. 
And he kind of puts it so the people in this region can easily go here and the people in this region can easily go there. And he sets them and he makes it easier. And he, he, he says, there's no reason for you to travel all the way to Jerusalem. You can do it in this region here. You can have all your worship without ever having go across the border. You don't need an enhanced license. You don't need a visa. You're not, I want to make it real easy for you folks. Verse 30, and this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And they went up. Some of them went to Dan, some went to Bethel. Now, now what Jeroboam is doing here, he making these calves. Now, this is not the first time a, a, a golden calf has ever been made. The first time it was ever made goes uh, back to the book of Exodus. When Moses was up there receiving the Ten Commandments from God in Exodus chapter 32, a similar event happened. And when you read through it, you read about the fact that uh, uh, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, he's up there in Mount Sinai, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and, and they said to him, Make us gods which shall go before us for this man Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We wot not what has become of him. They knew what became of him. He was up there communing with God. They knew. But this is a willful ignorance. And we, we were discussing today in the car the difference between the two types of ignorance. There's, there's an ignorance where you're actually ignorant of an issue because no one's ever taught you about it. There are many people that we witness to on the street and we bring them a gospel tract about Jesus Christ and we're living up in a nation now that, that's almost devoid of true Christianity. Right. When I was a little boy and, and uh, television was first coming out, uh, so, you know, the 50s when television was becoming kind of big. There was only three channels and, and uh, television came on in the morning about 7 o'clock. It had a few things during the day and then about 11, 12 o'clock it signed off. They did the American flag and uh, what's that one song they always play? The National Anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance. And then all of a sudden went blank and this, this eye came on and it just buzzed through the night and there was nothing. And when it went on in the morning, sometimes I was up early enough, the first program on in the morning was a Bible program on every channel. I was a little kid. I wasn't crazy. I wanted to see a cartoon. But the first thing that came on was, was a Bible program. For 15 minutes, I think it was walking in the light or something like that. It was this Bible program that came on for just 15 minutes to start the day, and then the regular programs began. It was This was a kind of a Christian nation back then. Uh, uh, back then, the attendance at church for all the so-called Christian churches in this nation was like 85% attended at least once a month, most of them every week. But today... 50-something years later, we have people who've never even heard of Jesus Christ in America. The only way they've heard of him is, is as a cuss word. They don't know anything about him. And that, that's an ignorance. It's not willful. It's an ignorance I never heard. Now, when you speak to them and you tell them Jesus uh, saves... Jesus redeems. Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And, and here's a gospel tract. And if you'd like to learn about Jesus, you can learn at a Bible. And when they take that and they go home and they look at the tract for a moment and they toss it aside and then they never search the Bible and they, they go back to their old ways and they have no interest in the Word of God, now that's a willful ignorance. They've chosen with their will to ignore what God said. That's a different type of ignorance. That was what was going on here. Those people knew that Moses was in the mount. This is willful ignorance. Now, probably the people that were stirring up this trouble were probably a lot of the mixed multitude in this chapter 32 of Exodus because a lot of the mixed multitude came out of Egypt. And probably a lot of these people that stirred up, uh, they got a few uh, dumb Jews to go along with them. And, and every so often there's a dumb Jew and, and they got a few that went along with every wind of doctrine and they stirred it up and it said, uh, Aaron, verse 2, said to them, okay, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. And the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears. They brought them to Aaron. He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And after he made a molten calf, they said, 
These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And there is the first time you see the golden calf. Now, you're going to see again uh, later on in uh, the book of uh, Judges that uh, Dan is going to set up an idol in their territory. But, but here's the golden calf, and now we're seeing this again by Jeroboam. Why a golden calf? Why a golden calf? I got a book here from the Folio Society from England. It's uh, over 50 years old. And usually the older you get, the better the book is. The newer you get, the worse the book is. Remember, liberals write history. Liberals are professional liars. Every generation, they alter the history a little bit more to lie to you. So practically 95% of what you hear today in a history book is lies. But you go back a ways, and here's some old-fashioned uh, research here, and i got a picture right here of one of the pharaohs bowing be, before a calf that came out of Egypt. And in this book of uh, Egyptology here on the Egyptians by, uh, I think it's Martin Gardner? Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner. Uh, let me see, page 316. Just to read you some uh, archaeological. Uh, Augusta Marietta, a young uh, Egyptologist uh, commissioned uh, by the French government to make a trip to uh, Egypt in uh, 1850. And uh, he went to Alexandria. He went to Cairo. He went to Strabo. And uh, went through a lot of the uh, sphinxes. And he finally found the Temple of Apis. Apis was the sacred bull of of Egypt. And this was one of the things that they, they uh, would uh, bow before. In 1851, November, uh, Mariette uh, went through vast subterranean structures where Apis bulls, they actually buried these things alongside the pharaohs. They would mark the, the date of the birth of the bull, uh, the death of the bull. They would put a huge sarcophagus where they would mummify the bull. He found no less than 64 uh, bulls uh, buried there in, uh, in Egypt. Let me see, page 356. Let me get to these other references I have here. Um, in the temples of the Egyptian gods, they would uh, bring gifts for the embalmment of the Apis bulls. So this is, a, this is a form of idolatry that came out of Egypt. And the mixed multitude were used to golden cat. Yes, brother. Very possible, similar to what the Indians do with the cow. That's very possible. As in this uh, page 371 here when I was reading, it, interestingly enough, this... this uh, uh, went on for centuries. Now we're talking about the Exodus was 1492 B.C. So before that, they were building these bulls. So maybe 1500, 1600 B.C., they're building these things. And, uh, uh, and here we are in 332 B.C. So now we're looking 12 centuries later when Alexander the Great came in to conquer Egypt and he arrived at Gaza uh, 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 the Persian satraps surrendered without fighting against Alexander and Alexander hastened upstream to Memphis and he sacrificed to the Apis bull and they, he was accepted as a pharaoh. So, so these sacred bulls were important uh, to the Egyptians and, and God told his people to go not back into Egypt. And he just didn't mean uh, physically, although he did mean physically, he meant spiritually. You could take the man out of Egypt, but you can't take the Egyptian out of the man. And, and here we have these, these calves being built here in, in, in Israel. These calves are going to be a sin unto the nation. But he's not done just with the calves and the idolatry. Notice verse 31, what, another thing that he does. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. Now God had determined that, that the Levites and only the Levites would be allowed to come before him because in that passage I read you in Exodus chapter 32, you're going to find there's only one tribe that refused to come before the golden calf. It was Levi. 
And because of that, God had originally had determined that in the nation of Israel, all the firstborns, that'd be Exodus chapter 13, would be sanctified unto the Lord for service. God's original desire for the nation of Israel was the firstborn of every tribe would be a priest. The firstborn of every family of every tribe. That was his desire. But only Levi held back from the worship of the golden calf. So therefore, he says, I'm going to take the house of Levi in the stead of the firstborns. And they're going to be my priests. And, and it was understood nobody could minister before God except the Levite. You had to be a priest of the Most High God. Now today, we are a nation of kings and priests, according to the book of First Peter, chapter two, we are an holy nation of kings and priests. And how do we come priests to the Most High God through the new birth? And no one else can approach unto God. And so, therefore, today, anybody who tries to come to God in prayer or worship, God does not accept. God only accepts the prayers and the worship of His people. So, if you're born again, you can approach to God. But you know what happens in these other denominations? They make priests of people who aren't priests of the Most High God. They make priests of the lowest of people. In other words, the folks that stand in the pulpits of these denominations, probably 99.9% .9 of them are not saved. They're not priests of the Most High God. They're priests of the people. And the and they're, they're, they're of the lowest of the people, not of the sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ, just as these men were not of the sons of Levi. And, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel. He sacrificing unto the calves that he made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he made. And he offered upon the altar which he made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel and he offered upon the altar and he burnt incense. I mean, if you looked at it from the outside, it would almost look real. I've got an altar. I've got incense. That's what was told in Exodus chapters 25 through 40. You need an altar. You need incense. You need to worship. I've got worship. I've got important feast days. They had feast days. It looks almost like something God has ordained, but God did not ordain it. It's his own incense. It's his own altar. It's his own feast. If, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 23, remember, in order to be a priest, you had to be of the tribe of Levi. So the book of Leviticus is written to the Levites to show them how to do the proper worship. And in Leviticus chapter 23, one of the high chapters in the book, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning, you can underline it, the feasts of the Lord which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are, you can underline it, my feasts. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. What the Lord is trying to teach the Levites is, all worship that will be given to me must be done according to my word. You have no vote in it. You have no say in it. I'm not passing a survey out to you. How would you like me to make this temple to make you happy that will make you more likely to come? What exactly would you like done around here that will make you comfortable? Let me, let me set this up so that it's seeker friendly. The Bible says there's none that seek after God. God seeks after you. You want to make it seeker friendly, you better make it God's way. And then if you're smart, you'll repent and come on your knees God's way. Because that's the only way you can approach God is the way He says you can approach Him. Those are His feasts, not yours. You can't ordain a feast. In America, we, we make up days. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day, Veterans Day. 
You can make all that stuff up, God says. But it's got nothing to do with me. Have you ever noticed around here we almost never have a service based around one of those days? They're, God didn't ordain them. People ordained them. Hallmark cards ordained them. The Congress ordained them. But not God. So we're not particularly interested in them. We're interested in what God said right here. These are His words. And God wants you to feast on His word in the order He gave it. Which is why we kind of teach through the book. These are His books. Feast on this. Now it's interesting. And I give you a portrait of what's happening. Here is the beginning of the Civil War. And, and the beginning of the war as to what separated Bible-believing Christianity from counterfeit Christianity was in Rome. Look at the name Jeroboam. I was on the Catholic website today looking for the Roman Catholic Church Fathers. On their website, there were five fathers they mentioned that were cardinal, very important in the forming of the, the uh, church. Let me try and give them to you in reverse order. I'm going to try and see if my brain can do it in reverse order. There was uh, Pope Gregory the Great. I'm doing it in reverse order. Because the first one is the guy <laughs> mentioned here. Pope Gregory the Great. Pope Leo the Great. Cyril of Alexandria. Augustine of Hippo. And a man by the name of... Jerome. Hmm, let's see. Jeroboam. I wonder if I can spell Jerome there. Well, what I can spell out of Jeroboam is I can get the word Rome out of his name. And the four letters left over are Joab. This means father. I don't know. Does Rome have any fathers? Do they have anybody in charge of Rome called a father? You got, I got two golden calves here. First thing I noticed, even within this land, you know what there is? There's division. There's divided worship. It's not unified. In, in Roman Catholicism, which uh, Jerome was the father of, which is a lot like Jeroboam, you've got divided worship. You've got two forms of worship. Now, I'm going to take you back to that passage where, where Dan built its first image. It'd be in the book of uh, Judges. I'll find it for you in a moment. It might be 19th chapter. I'm trying to remember where it is off the top of my head. Judges uh, chapter, is it 19? Judges 18. Judges 18. There's divided worship in the Roman Catholic Church. It's not unified. It's divided. See, God wants you to have the unity of the faith. There's one God, one Father, one Lord, one Spirit, one baptism, one faith, one book. Unite my heart, Lord. God does not, a divided mind, a divided heart is unstable. Divided worship is unstable. Here, when they made their first uh, image, the, the children of Dan, uh, they stole an image that was made by a Micah. I don't know if Micah made it or the man of Mount Ephraim. I think, I think Micah made it. And, and that image was basically in the form of a man. And it was a carved wooden man like a statue. And they covered it with gold and they, put some, they decked it with some jewels. And, and the tribe of Dan came along and they stole that thing. And it says at the end of the chapter, um, verse 30, And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And they set up this graven image up here in Dan. So Dan was noted for idolatry from a long time before Jeroboam took over. And it was set up like a man. And one of the things that Roman Catholics have set up in, in their worship is the ecclesiastical college of cardinals. There's a man, the Pope, and the men who are around him. And it's set up like a man, but not the God-man, but a mere mortal man. And that's one of the things. And the other thing that's set up there is, is the golden calf. Now, that calf was Apis 
the bull. And the popes used to write something that were called bulls. From where we get the word bulletin. And I don't know how to spell if that's right. Did I spell it wrong? Or is it the I before the E? I have no idea. But the point is bull. And, and what they have is they have their own writings and they have their own men. The Nicolaitans, the ones that are in charge. And so it, I'm, I, what I'm trying to show you is that in the history of the nation of Israel, what happened to them physically is a spiritual portrait as to what was going to happen to the church. And right there, early on, you've got division. And early on, 400 years in, you had division in, it's about the same time period. It's about the exact same time period. From 1452 when they entered the land to about 975. And it was about the time that uh, uh, the Lord gave the apostles the word until the very writings of Jerome and Augustine of Hippo when you had the same division in Christianity into all of a sudden you've got the southern ones that are faithful to the book and the Lord and you've got these other ones who all of a sudden are making priests of the lowest places, having divided worship, listening to men, and reading bull. Just a bunch of bull, bull feathers. And there's your picture. We're just about done. Any any questions? Yes. Yes. First Kings chapter 11 and verse uh, 40. And Solomon sought to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt. So Jeroboam had spent time in Egypt. And it's very interesting, by the way, looking uh, that's that, that probably historically where he got the idea for the golden calf. But it's interesting, um, when you look at the division that's coming, Roman Catholics with the work of Jerome and Augustine of Hippo and Origen of Alexandria wrote a Bible, a counterfeit Bible, the first real counterfeit New Testament version of the Bible around that time. And it became a Jerome's Vulgate. And it was that counterfeit Bible that then uh, was made, it was very royally uh, printed with lots of money. Most of the poor Christians, by the way, Christians are poor. True Christians usually are poor. Sorry, doesn't fly in America, but that's the truth. They always have been. God doesn't choose many mighty, many wise, many uh, rich or wealthy. He chooses the poor things of the world, the simple things of the world to confound the wise and the rich, the poor in uh, pocket, but rich in faith. And those rich in pocket are usually poor in faith. And, and usually the Bibles that they had were little uh, writings on papyrus fragments, a very cheap form of paper. But these Bibles of Jerome's were written on vellum, very expensive uh, skins of animals that kept for a long time. And uh, one of them was put in the Vatican. And one of them uh, circulated into a region of Mount Sinai and was put in a monastery of St. Catherine's in the Sinai region. And they were uh, discovered, quote-unquote, in the 1800s. Uh, what was the one guy that uh, discovered them? I forget his name. Uh, his name is uh, slipping my mind. Uh, the one that spent the money and bought the one out of uh, St. Catherine's. But anyways, uh, Tischendorf. I think Tischendorf. Con, uh, Conrad Tischendorf. And, and they got these uh, Bibles and, and they brought them out and they were pristine and in beautiful condition. And probably, quote unquote, the oldest uh, collective manuscripts that we have to this day. They were in pristine condition. Why is that? Nobody read them. Nobody used them. Real Bibles are used and falling apart. Bibles that are in great condition aren't being read. See, I read this book. 
and and real Christians read their Bibles and and passed them on and and used them every day and and Christians that have Bibles that are in pristine condition don't consult them and don't read them and nobody used Jerome's Bibles they were they're basically garbage they're they're counterfeits and the work came out of Egypt Alexandria Egypt and today all the modern Bibles the NIV the New American Standard the New King James the New World Translation. They all come out of Alexandria from Jerome's Bible. Only the King James Bible comes from the received New Testament text that came out of Syria, uh, Acts 11, 26, 27, where the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, Syria. And so one of the things that uh, has happened is just like this, we've got our golden calf of an Egyptian Bible written by men who weren't the priests of God. See, because go to Jude. Go to the book of Jude, the last uh, book, which like the tribe of Judah, the last book uh, before Revelation, the, the book before Revelation, second last book. So you can see early on, the first thing they wanted to do was write a counterfeit Bible. And that counterfeit Bible is now working its way into the church. And we're at a time of great apostasy. Just like Israel by the end is going to be in great apostasy and carried off into captivity, the church will be carried off into captivity. Most of what is called the church will enter the tribulation and follow the Antichrist. And the remnant will be plucked out of it. God will pluck the wheat out and the tares will get bound and go forth to the Antichrist. Book of Jude. Um, Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. I just want to talk to you about salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for, notice, the faith. Definite article, single, one. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by, what, was, what, what word of God was it? Was it the, the word of God. There's only one word of God. That one word of God produces the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, saints not the scholars. Amen. Jerome wasn't saved. Origen wasn't saved. Augustine of Hippo wasn't saved. They're the ones that wrote those counterfeits. Westcott and Hort, the men that first put forth what now is your NIV, but they put it forth originally as the RV, those were unsaved scholars. God doesn't commit his words to lost men. He commits them to his saints. Only Christians who are beguiled and childish and tossed about by every wind of doctrine would trust a scholar because he has a higher IQ. But relationship with God isn't based on head. It's based on heart. So not, I'm not impressed with someone who's got an IQ 150. I'm not impressed with someone who can speak Hebrew and Greek and English. I'm impressed with someone who knows God, a true Levite who's related to God by the new birth, not, not priests of the lowest people. Well, wait, they got high IQs. Yeah, but they got low moral standards. Read, read about the history of Westcott and Hort. Read about the history of some of these men involved in Bible translations. Nothing new under the sun. The portrait right there in your Old Testament. Any other thoughts? Yes? Pastor, I, I'm trying to remember one of those Bibles that you were talking about. Yes. was sold and modified. So it's, it's the same person that you mentioned. It talks about millions of dollars. Conrad Tischendorf? Yeah, yeah, they did. There was a lot of money exchanging hands on that thing. Uh, you're, you're correct. The, there, there is a lot of money in, in that get out. I'm sure those golden calves are worth a lot of money too. And I do not understand. You know, the world is strange in the things that it uh, prizes as being valuable. It's fool's gold. It's pyrite. They, they don't see the real wisdom and the riches of God's word. They see wisdom in other places. I mean, people uh, spending a million dollars to buy uh, a song written on a piece of paper by Bob Dylan. I, mean, I, said, I don't know. Makes sense to you. People spend lots of money to buy golf clubs that were touched by Elvis Presley. Okay, whatever. He actually handled those golf clubs. 
Shot a 73 on the first nine. Yes, I mean, I don't understand. But um, strange, yeah. Strange. Yes. Uh, the feast day. That's very interesting. I forgot to bring that research with me. The feast day was in the eighth month on the 15th day. That's around October 31st and November 1st. There's a feast called All Hallows, not Eve. That's just one part of it. It's a three-day feast that the Roman Catholic uh, Church celebrates. There's All Hallows Eve. That's October 31st. There's All Saints Day, November 1st, and All Souls Day, uh, uh, November 2nd. And it's a three-day feast that uh, Roman Catholics celebrate. And look at that Jeroboam right there. If you, I, if you do the calendar work to convert their calendar. Let me go back and, and find that thing. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, end of a chapter. Let's see, the 15th day of the 8th month. The 8th month, and again, you've got to work that thing out from when God gave them the months, which is March the 15th. And when you work it forth, let's see, March 15th. Okay, I'm going to try and count. Uh, April 15th, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, and... Uh, so right in here, it's working right around the time of, um, if I did it right, it works right around the time of uh, Halloween. And that's the day that they, uh, they ordained, which is right around that three-day Roman Catholic feast. So even there is another picture of it. So the Lord is centuries ahead, and the portraits are right there, if we would uh, pay attention and read our Bibles and think about what we're reading and and I, I you know I I don't expect uh, you know the, the, a lot of people in the pew to do that, but I expect the leaders to do it. I expect the pastors to do it, because if they were doing it, we wouldn't tolerate this stuff. I'm not going to fight it, but I'm going to preach it. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to prepare you. I'm not going to fight it. Let them do it. You want to go? Lord says, go ahead. Have after it. God will give you a free will. He'll judge you for what you do with it, but he'll give you free will. You want to run to a counterfeit church? Enjoy your life on planet Earth. The judge of all the earth will do right when he meets you. And ignorance will be no excuse. Particularly willful ignorance. Anything else? That's a good study. Next week, we'll look more and see what happens in the divided kingdoms. Lord, we do thank you for um, helping us to uh, see the portraits that you've uh, put there, actual historical, physical events which portray for us what was going to happen spiritually uh, to your church. Uh, your spiritual bride, the church, is so uh, similar to the physical bride, Israel, that you had. Help us uh, to learn from these things. Help us to uh, study these uh, historical uh, truths and, and to learn the spiritual lessons and help us to avoid uh, the errors that were made and help us to cling to the truth. Please, by the Spirit of truth, guide us into all truth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.